It's my pleasure and a great honor to warm welcome you on behalf of the World, the World Economic Forum. My name is Philipp Rösler. I'm Managing Director on the Managing Board. I'm responsible for all our regional summits around the world. And first and foremost, I will say thank you to the Panamanian government, to the Panamanian business society for this outstanding support and as well for this beautiful and excellent yesterday's reception. So, President Martinelli, thank you very much. And as we mentioned yesterday, there could not be a better place than the canal, and there could not be better timing than its 100th anniversary. Because the canal is a proof, is a symbol, how infrastructure can connect economies, markets, regions, and people. And that is part of our three days program. But we have also major topics like inclusive growth, fostering workforce, improving skills, education, science, and technology. But to say you the truth, the program is not the reason for the uniqueness of the regional summit on Latin America. There are two reasons. First reason, are you as our respective participants. Because we all know that Latin America is the fast growing, very important region in the world. It has become more and more important in the global economic world map. And we are not here only for three days. We are not here to rush in for three days, to make business for three days, and rush out after three days. No, we are interested in a long-term relationship, in a sustainable partnership, in a friendship. I know that is your mindset of doing business. And the second reason is, you as participants as well, because I'm convinced that you know many organizations and institutions which can bring people together, particular business leader and public figures. But the composition of all our participants is unique. And the composition mirrors the philosophy of the World Economic Forum, our multi-stakeholder idea. We have here our politicians, seven heads of states, heads of government from far away from Kosovo, dear Prime Minister. We have here more than 20 ministers, state secretaries, so public figures, more than 400 CEOs, business leaders, social entrepreneurs. We have here science, education, and the youth, for example, our global shaper and young global leader. And I'm convinced that this kind of gathering is becoming more and more important because although we have Internet, fax, Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp. The personal contact is crucial. To see in the eyes of your counterpart, and then to decide if she or he is a good business partner, partner, or at the end, a friend. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our way to bring people together. That is the way of the World Economic Forum to create a community of interest interest in the region of Latin America, to create a community of purpose to support you, to shape your regional agenda in Latin America. And that is our way to create a community of actions, actions to improve the state of the world. And after the next three days, actions to improve the state of Latin America. So ladies and gentlemen, the Regional Summit 2014 on Latin America is now opened.
And I'm pleased to thank you, all our co-chairs, this three days, and to hand over to Marisol Agueta, our senior director and head of Latin America. And let me say thank you to Marisol and her team for this outstanding preparation of our regional summit on Latin America. Now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marisol. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much, Philip. Indeed, we have had an outstanding support with the government of Panama, the people of Panama, and very especially from President Ricardo Martinelli. We're very, very grateful, Mr. President. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the President of Kosovo, who's here with us today. Welcome, Madam President. It's an honor to have you. We're opening today the ninth World Economic Forum on Latin America with the presence of 650 leaders from the region, on, from outside of the region, in fact, from 50 different countries in the world. This is really a very important moment for Panama and for Central America. We're very proud of being here, Mr. President and people of Panama. Before beginning, I would like to convey our sympathies to President Michel Bachelet and to the people of Chile who have endured the very difficult moment of the earthquake that happened yesterday. And I would also like to make a special, a special acknowledgement to the participants from Venezuela that despite the ongoing very worrisome situation in their country have managed to be with us today. A welcome, you're very welcome and we look forward into supporting a favorable, fair, and sensible solution to the strife that you're enduring at this time. We have very distinguished guests in our panel today. We have with us Mr. Ricardo Martinelli, the president of Panama. This is Kamla Persard Bissessar, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Mrs. Laura Chinchilla, the President of Costa Rica, and President Otto Perez Molina of Guatemala. The main question we will be addressing this morning is what strategies are Latin American countries pursuing to achieve inclusive growth? We will begin with you, Mr. President. This Central American country, which has a privileged geographic location and a buoyant economy, has invested in infrastructure and has introduced business-friendly policies that embodies the dynamism and the potential that this region has. President Martinelli, Panama ha mantenido tasas de crecimiento Panama has had impressive growth rates. It has been able to grow up 17 spaces in the Global Competitiveness Index carried out by the World Economic Forum. And also, it has positioned itself in an amazing way as a key player in international trade. Can you please share with us what have been the main drivers behind these successful results? What are the recommendations that you would give to the leaders, the heads of states in Latin America to boost the sustainable growth in the region? Thank you very, mu very much, Marisol. First, uh, welcome, Madam Price, Prime Minister, and distinguished leaders of the World Economic Forum, distinguished guests. I would like to wish, first of all, the recovery to the leader of the World Economic Forum who is going through different health issues and I'm going to proceed to respond. All of the countries have a policy called red carpet in order to attract investors and when you go to the different countries what you have is pretty much red tape instead and it's hurtful to say this because the truth of the matter is that Panama's success has been in the first place that I am not a politician, I'm a businessman, and as a businessman I'm used to looking and focusing on results. And because we have a red tape policy, 
which is very difficult to take apart from one day to the next. I think that the most important thing is for the president to be behind all of the projects. The president has to be following up continuously throughout all of the work taken by the government because the steps and the procedures that all of our countries follow with that famous red tape make uh, the situation difficult and the execution difficult as well in Panama. For example, um, the first thing that you're recommended when you hold the position as a president is that you need to help certain sectors of the economy in order for those sectors to be productive and uh, feasible. And the economists always talk about the infant industry theory. We did the exact opposite, however. The government began with an aggressive public investment plan. And by having this, we had to reorganize the tributary and the fiscal programs in Panama because there were many sectors that were simply not paying taxes. There were many sectors, for example, the banking industry in Panama, which is a very um, successful industry, had an average rate of 7.8% tax rate. However, the worker in the bank, it could be the cashier or the manager himself, paid 27.5%. Things that were so unjust had to be balanced out. And so Panama's success is based on the fact that our budget, 45 of 45 cents of every dollar is invested in infrastructure. Everything that Panama has done has been to take advantage of its competitive advantage, its geographic position, the interoceanic canal, the port hub that, according to the World Economic Forum, is the fourth best connected airport in the world. The Port Hub, it's the sixth most important according to the World Economic Forum as well. And likewise, we have began with a very aggressive policy to change the education system in Panama because it was lagging, lacking, it was um, obsolete. And with a, a social inclusion policy, According to the statistics, 38% of Panamanians lived in poverty and extreme poverty. But currently, 23% live in, in poverty and extreme poverty. So there has been an important reduction of poverty and extreme poverty due to the economic growth that there has been, which it has been an average of 9% in the past five years. And also thanks to the fact that we are in a full employment economy and also thanks to the legalization of all the foreigners here in Panama. That was a very risky move because in Panama there are many foreigners and uh, they, were, they were part of the informal economy. Every time they were stopped by an officer or a policeman, what was promoted was corruption. And so because they are now legal and the taxes have been reduced and to give a, a close follow-up to all of these strategic investments that the country has done as a state. For example, this week we're going to be opening or launching the metro or the subway of Panama this Saturday. It's 14 kilometers and soon we're going to be beginning or launching the second line which has 27 meters, and the third line that's going to be a monorail that's going to go to a city in the west side of Panama called Chorrera. What we have done is to connect the points. And I advise for you to listen to that famous speech from Stephen Jobs from Stanford University 2005 called Connecting Dots. And what we have done in Panama is precisely that, collecting, connecting the competitive advantages that the country has the possibilities of being successful in areas as mobility, air and land transportation, and maritime transportation. You mentioned that the best foreign affairs minister has been the Venezuelan presidents. And I say this um, as a joke. In other countries in Latin America, 
there is a lack of tranquility or an attack to the freedom of speech or a direct attack towards the private sector. The citizens of those countries try to find better returns on their investment, um, safer places, and Panama has become a safer place. It has become a safe place because it's protected from tsunamis, earthquakes, there's low inflation. It's a safe place country where there isn't um, envy towards foreigners. It's a country that receives with open arms people from abroad. And that is a very important competitive advantage that the government has had because we've been able to have good um, income through the collection of taxes and to implement an inclusive social program and boost economic growth. Without economic growth, we would not be able to have social inclusion. Without this the country will not be able to change the education system. And so I believe that the most important thing that I have done as a president has been changing the old economic and financial structures that we had in Panama, giving opportunity to those that didn't have them previously by charging the taxes and giving a close follow-up to each procedure so that the investments were done and carried out. And it has taken me five years to go to all the World Economic Forums and those held in Latin America so that this summit was possible here in Panama. Because the best promoter that a country has is its president. And the president, and I advise all of the presidents that are here to go to all the World Economic Forums because this is the place to be. This is where you get to know people and this is where um, you move investments. Philip seems to be very happy by what I'm saying. Honestly, all of the countries look to attract investment, but the way that you attract investment more quickly, and the best promoter that a country can have is its precedent. At the same time, however, when the investors come to the countries, they find this enormous amount of red tape and bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy and red tape has to be eliminated progressively. And that is not the work of a precedent. However, when a work within a state budget is carried out, the president also wants to give a good follow-up from the beginning to the end. Thank you, Mr. President. We also have with us more than 400 important leaders in Latin America and also from outside of the region. What message would you like to give to this business sector? What is the role in these successful strategies? I think it's very important. I would like to advise all of the business people to participate in politics. If you are not part of politics, someone else that does not have the capacity and your experience is going to step in. This is not to give a donation to a businessman or to put the most foolish relative to go and become a, a politician. It's not a matter of donating money to who you think is going to win. This is about participation. And the person needs to accept the position through selection. One thing is the a position through election, which is an issue because it does have an impact in the personal and private life and also costs and sacrifices. And another thing is when a president is selected to be, or a person is elected to be a minister or a company director. My recommendation for all the business people in the private sector is for you to support your leaders, regardless of their tendency or the country that they come from. Because if a leader, a country leader, does not receive good advice and there's no support from the private sector, believe me, he's going to be receiving advice from other people that don't think the same way. And that is the reason why I stepped in politics. I went into politics because I was perhaps as many of you. I went to the parties talking about politics and I was criticizing. But a minister once told me, look, from the outside, we don't pay attention to you because all you're doing is criticizing. You have to step inside so that inward, inside, you can promote changes. So my advice is for you to become involved in politics and for you to participate in the way that you consider is most appropriate for the improvement of the country. And also because when a businessman participates, the person supports the country for its improvement. Thank you, Mr. President. Now we are going to introduce 
a, another successful story in our region. It has been known for its notable economic success. It ranks among the top 40 countries in the income per capita, and it's no longer considered a developing country according to the OECD. Its economic success has been based on the influence of the energy industry. It has passed from, become, from being an oil-based economy to a, oil, to a gas-based economy, the natural gas-based economy. But you have also diversified it very, very much into the services sector. You have invested in developing tourism, in developing the financial sectors, and you have also had important success in manufacturing. But economic growth is in fact of very little use without investment in the region's most precious resource, and this is its people. Can you tell us, Madam Prime Minister, about your social policies as well? I understand that you have been very committed in promoting gender parity and addressing the needs of women and girls in Trinidad and Tobago. Can you share what have the, been the most successful policies towards that end, and what is the impact that these policies have had? Certainly, thank you. Uh, may I first uh, take a moment to thank His Excellency President Martelly for inviting us here to uh, participate in this forum and for the warmth and hospitality of the government and people of Panama on, upon our arrival. May I also take one moment um, to share our concerns with respect to the natural disaster which occurred in Chile uh, just yesterday, it seems so long ago. Um, so we share the concerns of the people there and of course in any way that we can assist from the region we would be willing so to do. With respect to your specific questions, um, yes, we are oil-based, uh, energy-based, natural gas, oil and natural gas, and that presents a curse as well as a blessing. Uh, you would have heard of the curse of oil, um, where our economy is so uh, strongly dependent on the energy sector. What happens is that the other sectors have been left aside um, and the wages are so high, the salaries are so high in the energy sector, it is difficult to get people to work in other sectors in the economy. Um, one strategy that we have deployed uh, was that of ensuring that every single child had a place in a primary school, and every single child thereafter would have a place in a secondary school. We are now working towards a universal preschool education. That is to say, from ages three to five, we are well on our way to that. We are building the, the preschool centers as we speak, and we about uh, we hope to be about 60% tertiary uh, education by the end of this year. So, if you if you would want to say what I see as being um, the cent the focal point for development and inclusive growth uh, would be education. Education is a passport out of poverty. Education is your key to a better quality of life. And that is where I've really generated a lot of my efforts now as Prime Minister. And prior to becoming Prime Minister in my past life, I was Minister of Education. And when I was then Minister of Education, I'd set that policy in the year 2000 for a free secondary education. So for 10 years, we have had every person in my country having the opportunity to access secondary education. Um, in addition to that, when I became Prime Minister, I promised in my uh, in, in my conversations on the campaign trail, I had promised that should we form the government uh, that every single child entering the secondary school would be given a laptop computer. So education, yes, and technology. I think those are two drivers for uh, greater inclusive growth. We did form the government, and this year will mark five years. It means that every child in a secondary school form one, two, three, four, five, everyone would have had access to a laptop, and that process will continue. Um, in other ways, what we have sought to do is diversify the economy. We like to think of ourselves because of where we are positioned. Like Panama, we are very protected because we're very far south in the Caribbean, and therefore the hurricane belt officially be outside of the hurricane belt. You know, the hurricanes are very devastating to a lot of the Caribbean islands. So that location, English speaking, a highly educated workforce, and um, in the world standard, we have been, we have been uh, voted as the world's third 
happiest people in the world. The third happiest people in the world. It has to do with a great climate, um, joy to be full of life. We like to think of ourselves as the gateway to the Americas between Eastern and Western, located there in the Atlantic and in the Caribbean basin. So I invite you to come to Trinidad and Tobago. President Martelli has been there, and we were very happy to have him. Other leaders in the region, we have a lot of opportunities for investment because we are seeking to diversify the oil and gas sector. We are looking into tourism, as you mentioned. We are looking into uh, ICT development. We are looking into uh, shipbuilding, the maritime industries, several areas, about seven pillars, the foundations for a diversifying our economy and for liftoff in, in terms of that. Um, those are our strategies, basically. I, I invite you, as I say, to come. We have the world's greatest carnival. No uh, disrespect to Brazil. <laughs> the Trinidad Tobago Carnival is one of the greatest in the world. Why? Because it's not at one venue. It's the entire nation throughout the land. That is an industry in itself, the creative industries we are seeking to expand, the fashion industry and the creative industry. But those who have been, well, they will tell you, um, there was a Panamanian young lady who came this year to a carnival. I met her here and I said, how was it? She said, I cried. I just cried. Why did you cry? She said, it was just overwhelming. It, because it's just thousands and thousands and thousands of people on every street, on every corner, in every park. That's our creative industry. I welcome you to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank, thank you, you very much. Friend. Philip, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And we have among us another great woman leader from the region, President Laura Chinchilla. Querida Presidenta. Dear President, Costa Rica is in the process to become part of the Alliance of the Pacific, and your country is known globally for many different successes. Among these, due to the environmental awareness and the visionary investment in education, a bet towards development in different sectors, and also because of the strong democracy and very solid institutions. The next April 6th, we're going to have presidential elections in Costa Rica, and we would like to know what is the legacy that you're leaving behind in Costa Rica, the most precious legacy after your mandate? Well, good morning, and thank you very much, Marisol. Thank you, Ricardo, as well, for hosting this event where, once again, we have a confirmation of the enormous capacity that Panama has been developing from the point of view of the invitation of different events and being a host. We can see the modernization efforts that, especially in terms of logistics and infrastructure, Panama has offered to the whole world. It's also a pleasure to share this space with my colleagues from Guatemala and Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, with this enormous community of business people, people from academia, and also others that are connected and concerned with the global agenda specifically in this chapter of the forum on Latin America. As Marisol was mentioning, we are very close to the new chapter in Costa Rica as once again, for many years, we have already been one of the oldest and strongest democracy in Latin America and we're going to go to the presidential elections to have a relay in the government. And now that I was listening to Ricardo Martinelli about the enormous facilities that are offered to the foreigners, then I was asking myself, maybe he would like to welcome me and have give me a migration privilege because I'm going to be out of a job soon. So I promise not to compete with the Panamanian politicians. That would be an advantage. Well, yeah. So we're going to go to a presidential election soon, as we have always done it, in the framework of a great civic fervor and respect also, despite the differences in the different parties. And we hope that Costa Rica is able to maintain what perhaps has been its biggest distinctive seal. When Marisol so gently introduced me, she highlighted at least four elements that I consider tend to be key in the development of any nation. 
because nations, as in the case of human beings, are societies, they're living beings, and they require, in the same way as a human being requires, the taking care of many balances so that that development is the most balanced type of development possible. And that has been the distinctive seal of Costa Rica, a very small country, but that can manage to have achievements institutionally in human development, environmental sustainability, and also integration with the world. For me, these are the four essential elements by which a government and a president has to guarantee in order to have that balanced development that we should aspire to. And so sometimes it's very difficult to be able to have a quick summary in one term what your footprint is going to be. For example, for a country like Costa Rica where the obligation that we have is to try to maintain that balance. For example, when a president in Costa Rica is asked, how are you going to grow? How are you going to add one, two, or three points to the gross internal product? Immediately, they know that they're never going to be able to do it competing with cheap labor, or they're not going to be able to do it degrading the environment because we have expressively um, set aside to the exploitation of the environment. Costa Rica does not want to exploit oil or extract gold, and so it's much more complex to imagine the platforms that would take into account all these elements to have a balance. So I'm going to quote for each one of these pillars where I consider that we have had a legacy, which what it, do, what, what it does is to be part of that developed and wholesome development that Costa Rica has aspired to. In terms of institutionality, without a doubt, the biggest challenge that we had as President Martinelli mentioned, was the issue of an excessive bureaucracy. So we tackled it strongly to have a improvement in the regulations. In the 2003, the World Bank considered us one of the 10 countries in the world that improved the most in this issue. I have to recognize that we still have much room to grow because the truth is that it was an element that was reducing competitiveness. In addition, we also foster a good practice that I recommend for Latin America, which is to integrate a presidential council of competitiveness. And I chair that board. And it has the participation of the private sector. It allowed us to agree into an agenda that we kept for this period of time. And we were able to have important progress in many policies that affected the competitiveness of the economy. The third element, in terms of the strengthening of the institutions or institutionality, was to fight strongly to begin our process of adherence to the OCDE because if something had affected the development in Latin America in its institutions, it's not to have a clear route of where you want to move forward. The OCDE is a club of good practices and we're going to be part of it, the OECD, we're going to be part of it in 2015. In human development, we consider that education is the key axis or the pillar. And from that point forward, we consider that universal education has been available for several years. And so the challenge was not a challenge of access, but rather one of quality and belonging. And so we had important curricular reforms that were connected to the introduction of the logical thought process, math, science. Technical education was also a key pillar. We broadened the culture of technical education. And we also wanted to be assessed against the best standards because it's not valid to say, oh, we're the best educational system in Latin America. Chile and Costa Rica are because we know that Latin America is a disaster from the educational point of view. So we went to be evaluated against the PISA standards. And this is also 
giving us a position that shows quality in education. And finally, in terms of human development, we extended as a universal access all of the health care attendance to early childhood. And so we're trying to close the gaps between children of different social sectors. In terms of sustainable development, I don't want to elaborate much on, but I just want to highlight that there cannot be a development with inclusion if we don't consider the sustainability component. And the challenge in Costa Rica was to look beyond. We're the fifth greenest country in the world, but we had not taken into account the blue agenda as we should. And also, the topic of integration with the world. Now, it's not enough for nations like Costa Rica that have been open nations to sign bilateral trade agreements to provide safety and security to investment and to promote trade. The country progresses in a reconfiguration in commercial blocks. The agreement between Europe and the United States is perhaps one of the challenges, the greatest challenges that the Latin American economy is going to face. In this regard, we celebrate the Alliance Group, Alliance Trade Group of the Pacific, and we went with Panama. We were one of the first countries that raised our hand to be members as observers. And fortunately, the last meeting in Cartagena in Colombia, it was approved for Costa Rica to be the fifth country to be part of the Alliance of the Pacific. And we think that one of the best things that has happened in Latin America is this. It's a group of serious nations. It's a group of nations that advocate for a solid integration of their economies. And it is a group of nations that also is very clear on where the world is heading in the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. We also have here with us another head of state who is leaving an important legacy in Latin America. President of Guatemala, from the beginning of his office, has been committed with the promotion of innovative policies in order to be able to face woes that have been very severe in Latin America. And insecurity and the tr drug trafficking is one of these. We have already seen, Mr. President, that there is more awareness in terms of the need to involve the civil society and the private sector in providing uh, proactive responses and collaborative efforts in order to address this issue. We have also seen important measures that have been carried out in terms of new regulations in the United States, specific states of the country, and also Uruguay that depenalizes the use of certain drugs. Can you tell us what your diagnosis would be and what your next steps would be in order to advance in an innovative and cooperative matter or way in order to address this issue? Yeah. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to the President and to Ricardo Martinelli and the first uh, Prime Minister to be with us today. As it was said by uh, Ricardo, who was fighting for five years to uh, bring the forum here to Panama, we have had two years in the same struggle, and we hope that Guatemala, we hope that still we continue in the presidency, as presidency. We have four years to go, and we are, you will be welcome to go to Guatemala. Too. The topic that is very important of the safety is. And before I get into this topic, I would like to tell you that many uh, think that Latin America uh, is a very valiant uh, region. Uh, many emphasize that Latin America, the problems that Central America has, and within the problems of Central America, the North Triangle that is called Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala because they are close to Mexico, and of course, because the closeness with Mexico and the United States. But before I enter about that topic, I would like to mention that the region of Latin America is a region with a lot of potential, and more so uh, 
to frame the violence and the societies. I think that as well as is being said by the colleagues of states that just have spoken, the potential that has been demonstrated by Panama for the growth, the stability, the growth that Costa Rica has had for a long time, the potential and the development of Trinidad and Tobago and many countries of the region, it is important at every day it could be reinforcing that potential that there is in Latin American region. And of course, to make emphasis of the potential that it is in the region of Central America in the countries of SICA. Uh, we have been doing a great effort, not just in the safety net, that I'm going to be talking about that for the integration of our countries. And we do that because we need to have economies of a bigger scale. Guatemala, we are 15 a million of uh, people from Guatemala, but if we gather the, the, the region, we are 45 millions in Central America, and we add South of Mexico, we have 70 million in this region. There is a, a more interesting economy for entrepreneurs and for the investment that could come. And from there, we have made a, an effort, of course, in Guatemala, as well as Panama and Costa Rica and the other countries of Latin uh, Central America. They are in the same struggle to be able to obtain the confidence of the institutions that is something that it gives the stability and the opportunity of that potential for investors in the, to come to the region, and the region could be uh, better. The infrastructure that so we could facilitate the, the, the cost of the logistics is very important. We are projecting six um, million of uh, three, times, three millions of that and 1,500 megas in energy, renewable energy, that they are already uh, invested in our countries and they're going to be ready in two years, not only to place us as a country with the uh, cheapest energy, but it's also an effort to facilitate that those investments would stay. At the 28th of this month, I, could have, I will have the opportunity uh, in Mexico, in a meeting that were the chiefs of states, in the, the Caribbean chiefs of states, and there I will have the opportunity, and, and I am uh, very grateful to the president of Mexico to have a fast, that it goes from Guatemala to Mexico. Then it's going to be a big change. Uh, Regardless of the efforts that we have done, it is going to cost uh, 600 millions of dollars. And that is the first step for Central America. And we could hope that in the future, this gas pipe would go to all the countries in Central America. And I mentioned this because each one of our countries is, is making their best effort to, that, uh, to have all those opportunities. But there we have a point that is always brought up, and I am glad that it's here in this forum too, is the, uh, the violence that, um, and the vinculation that we have uh, that could be the, the transit or the, or the uh, consumption of the, uh, these drugs. I would like to say that regardless that uh, decisions have not really been made in this topic and the change of that, these policies in these drugs, they are steps that they've been done already. We have had, and I appreciate that, uh, President Martinelli, and of course, Costa Rica, that they were with me in Guatemala recently. And to start talking about this, and we started talking about this, because in effect, it has been uh, in different forums, and we believe that what we have said, it has a solid base. 50 years in this struggle against this uh, uh, traffic of drugs, and, and the results are not, no, 
are, they are not the ones that we really hope to have. This uh, traffic of drugs is really uh, attached to values and unsafetyness in the countries. This means that the paradigma of this that we have really following in these years, they have not really given us the results that we'd like. And we have to start looking at another alternatives that could give us the privilege or that could give us another route instead of uh, continue doing the same that we have been doing for the uh, 50 years. I think we, I hope that it could give us the results, but I also would like to say that there are also things that every country is doing. And what I could say is about Guatemala, we have done very important things in the, la in the last two years. And in the city we have, obtained 37% uh, lower of the homicides and 37% of homicides in two years. And this year, we're going to lower to 50% to lower the homicides in the city of Guatemala. In the Department of Guatemala, we have been able to lower to 22%. And in Guatemala and the city of Guatemala, they there were, it was concentrated 50% of all the delinquency in the, um, in the city. So we have to continue with the same models that they are really uh, working. There are many things that we're also doing in each one of the countries and that they are giving us important results. I would like to say something also that is really important. I listened the other day precisely in another forum uh, something like this, that someone could say that the best policy, social policy, that it could be is a good e economic policy. And now I could add something else that the best policy that of safety is, is that the countries could have is also a good economic policy. And because if we measure that, if we have less poor people, more employment, more investment, more opportunities, we also been um, fighting against the poverty and also against the uh, violence in the that we cannot deny that we there are levels that we really have to fight against and the region is is working and they are they are making the best efforts there is a big growth as it's been said like Panama and uh, 3.5 growth uh, last year Guatemala is also going uh, working very uh, uh, with the uh, different sectors in the country, and uh, as we said in Mexico, we can we we can be on the side or we fight with the private sector or work with the private sector. And Guatemala, we are working with the private sector, and we are going to continue doing that with the private sector because they are the ones that invest and and give the opportunity to see if we put together all this situation. I think that Central America and Latin America has great possibilities to take advantage of this potential. Uh, and I think that we're going to be looking at this uh, growing with uh, a lot of importance. Energy that you mentioned is a very important point for the development, uh, sustainable development of our region. Also, safety needs, the, the public uh, safety is very important. And we also have another kind of safety need, the human safety need. And in that aspect, Latin America had advanced uh, tremendously, reducing the poverty from 44% to 30% in the last decade. And according numbers of the World Bank from yesterday for the first time, the percentage of the population in the middle class is above the, 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 the poor uh, uh, numbers. We are talking about a middle class that's about 35%, 32% in Latin America. And that is a poor uh, population of 30%. But in the middle of this population, there is a lot of vulnerability. And we would like to continue uh, asking to Martinelli, what is the strategy that you would recommend, uh, especially per in terms of part uh, uh, private sector participation? What, what do you think, uh, how can this be uh, attended? In order to continue reducing the poverty 
and uh, what are the opportunities to give these opportunities to the Latin America and uh, is th that we can go back to the same. Thank you very much. I think that Latin America is full of opportunities. The integration that the Central Americans are having and also with the incorpora incorporation of the Pacific Partnership or Alliance, which are business oriented and not ideological oriented and uh, with the boosting middle class i think that the consumption market that we will have in latin america the opportunities that there are in all of the countries there are some countries that are wasting a lot of time like argentina and venezuela but uh, there are countries that eventually are going to recover and with Brazil starting to look outwards instead of inwards, I am sure that what is happening in Latin America, which is the continent that has wasted a lot of time in politics and social experiments that have not um, had good results, I think that the solution that Latin America has is to increase the trade amongst ourselves to point towards that middle class so that it's not the sole taxpayers and also to give opportunities to the multi-Latin companies in different countries so that they have an opening of their capital so that all of us are able to be part of the growth in Latin America. Thank you, Mr. President. Tomorrow, we're also going to be witnesses of a very important signature, which is the signature of the op a free trade agreement between Panama and Mexico. Congratulations, Mr. President. On the issue of social